Good morning, everyone. We're so excited to have you here today. I want to welcome Ms. Barrera, Ms. Rios, Ms. Martinez, your classes. Um, it is March. We're almost to April. Um, and Region 1 and PATHS is very excited to welcome Dr. Uh, Karina Garza from DHR Health and, and their pharmacy uh, department. Hi, how are you doing? Doing good. How about you guys? Very good. Thank you. Well, we want to get started today talking about um, the pharmacy at DHR. Um, I will remind classes that this is being recorded. So if anybody you think is interested in seeing it, we'll have it on YouTube later. I'll send the link to your teachers and you'll be able to um, uh, set, you know, click the link and, and watch it. Um, so I want to welcome you and tell us a little bit about yourself, Dr. Garza. Uh, yeah, sure. So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Karina Garza. Um, I'm born and raised from Mission, Texas. Um, been here, lived here all my life, did all my education. I'm a, a Mission High School graduate. Um, I actually got into what was called a cooperative pharmacy program. Um, right out of high school. So this program was basically an accelerated path uh, to becoming a pharmacist and essentially getting my doctorate in, in pharmacy. So believe it or not, uh, the program, the way it worked was I went to two years as undergrad. And if some of you guys aren't aware, um, for pharmacy school, you don't need a degree. There's actually just prerequisites that you need, depending on the schools, they can all be a little bit different, maybe about 72 hours, maybe some closer to 80. Uh, but so essentially what that program did is I did all my prereqs within two years. Uh, we were automatically accepted into the University of Texas College of Pharmacy. Um, that's of course, we did have to keep grades. We had to be involved in community service. There were certain things that we had to keep, uh, ensure that we did uh, in order to stay in the program, but it was a pretty neat program right out of high school. So did those two years, went straight into the U University of Texas at Austin College of Pharmacy, which pharmacy school is four years because it's a doctoral program. Um, and it was pretty neat because I was actually able to return home my third and fourth year. So I saved money, <laughs> not yeah. having to uh, pay for room. And I was fortunate that I got to do all my rotations um, here in the Valley. And then um, I graduated from pharmacy school in 2010. And then my professional experience, uh, I was a clinical pharmacist, staff clinical pharmacist at uh, Nat Medical Center in Westaco. Uh, then I moved over to Mission Regional Medical Center in Mission, Texas, uh, where I was there for seven years and did clinical pharmacist work there. And I was also an uh, assistant director there for a, for a few years before I moved into the world that I am in now that I never thought I would be in. <laughs> Uh, but I'm a, you know, a clinical assistant professor with the University of Houston uh, College of Pharmacy and also am a clinical pharmacist at DHR Health, where I work mostly in the ER. So that's a little I, bit of my background. I, um, just to let the students know what we were working together yesterday, we did a workplace <laughs> learning. And so I learned a lot of new things. And I actually answered the question correctly, um, even though I was in the back and kept my answer quiet. But um, <laughs> So if we're talking about a hospital like DHR and you have all different kinds of pharmacy with pharmacists, which I want to talk about, but how many pharmacists are there at DHR Health? Okay, so um, I don't know if any of y'all are aware with DHR Health, but we're a very large facility. So we're over 600 beds and we have multiple specialties. Um, so when I asked this question to the group, <laughs> Uh, my answer, and this was for staff, so this includes everybody, pharmacists and pharmacy right. technicians, right? So the answers I got were like 20, 25, 30. Well, I surprised everybody, I guess it's that for you, but uh, <laughs> we have over 100 of staff. So we've got maybe about, you know, 50 to 60 pharmacy technicians and about 40 to 50 pharmacists. Well, I have to say, I, I took a tour of the pharmacy department, so I kind of already, yeah. I, I saw how many people were there, and I thought, okay, there's <laughs> got to be that many people someplace else also. So tell yeah. us about um, the different um, positions there are. I'll give you uh, a reason. 
Uh, our kids are on their pathway to um, whatever career they want to go into. Okay. And those students who are in the pathway to become a pharmacist, I know that there are different entry points and different ways that you can um, get into pharmacy um, with very little education, very few classes, and then all the way up to becoming a doctor. So can you tell us some of those positions? Yeah, so um, essentially getting into pharmacy school is pretty straightforward. Um, it's actually really great and really neat because like I mentioned, you don't need a degree. All you right. need to do is have those prerequisites. Now, of course, it's just like any other graduate or professional school. You wanna have community service. Um, you wanna make sure your grades are good. Um, you want to make sure that if you're going into pharmacy, you have maybe some kind of pharmacy experience or you've gone to maybe shadow um, or or you've done maybe research or things like that. Or maybe you've even just worked, um, you know, sometimes just work experience mm -hmm. kind of helps out on your resume right. to apply. So all that is what you need to get into school. Now, once you get in and there's an interview process and all that good stuff, uh, the schooling is pretty straightforward. You go three years, basically, of classroom work with a little bit of professional experience that you go into. We call it introductory pharmacy practice experience, where you go and you uh, basically work or shadow um, in a community pharmacy at, for, for one half, one part of it, and then the hospital pharmacy for another part. Then you get into your fourth year, and that's where you're doing kind of rotation. So that's kind of like, <coughs> excuse me. Um, what you might see physicians doing, right. uh, maybe in movies and things like that, where they're along with a, uh, you know, another physician or things like that. Well, in pharmacy, uh, our pharmacy students are called pharmacy interns. And so who they're with is with their pharmacy preceptors. And so that's what you're doing your fourth year. You're, you're getting your feet wet. Now, the beauty of pharmacy is there's so many different things that you can do. Um, and that's where it all kind of starts at your rotations. Mm -hmm. So you do have like four main core rotations that you have to take uh, hospital, community, you do clinical, which is when you round with a team. Um, and I think there's one more, uh, there's two clinicals total uh, for most schools. Of course, some schools right. are different, but that's pretty much the basis. But then you get to pick what's called electives. Mm -hmm. And so there is where you can start thinking, hmm. Uh, maybe you want to be a professor where some colleges of pharmacies can do that. Maybe you want to work with the state board of pharmacy. You can do a rotation there. Uh, maybe you're interested in drug discovery and research and things like that. There is, uh, you know, rotations there, all, all different kinds of things. You want to go into, um, you know, psychiatric or pediatric pharmacy, um, transplant pharmacy, um, you could do, we have a diabetes and endocrinology clinic in at DHR. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's where, uh, you know, we counsel and there's two pharmacists there who take care of a lot of our patients. Um, and that's pretty neat. That's called, um, like outpatient, uh, pharmacy right. and, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it could all start there with rotations. Then after that, once you graduate, then you can choose to do what's called a residency program where you get additional one-year training. And that's usually the PGY-1, uh, that residency program, the first year is usually very general, but then you could actually do a second one where it would become more specific. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of where, you know, it would all happen and where you can be. But I will tell you, even I did not do a residency program. There is a lot more pharmacy schools now than when I was there. Right. But, um, you know, you could come out of school and depending on your rotations, you make good connections. Um, you know, you may be able to land, your, land yourself a job right after, um, right. you know, and there's so many, there's so many different things. There's veterinary pharmacy, um, you know, uh, some people go, go and have to get their MBA with their doctorate and then they go, you know, into some kind of an administration role. So mm -hmm. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, that did. Uh, I want to also welcome uh, Mr. Valderas. If any of you have questions, go ahead and go to the chat and put a question there and we will ask Dr. Garza about that. So tell me about being a pharmacist. Um, 
we we did a lot yesterday. I was, I'm going <laughs> to tell those who weren't there because I don't think we have anybody who was there yesterday. Um, there's a lot of different um, things that a pharmacist will do during the day. And, and we got to see a little bit of that in a work-based learning uh, scenario that we did. So can you tell us about, you know, uh, drug preparation, IV preparation, all of that? Can you give us a little background on that? Yeah, of course. So again, um, for most of you guys, maybe you, the face of a pharmacist would be who you see at HEB or CVS or Walgreens or your community pharmacy, you know, um, your Lees, things of that here, science pharmacy, um, you know, here in our area. But believe it or not, uh, if you heard my professional experience, I've really only worked in a hospital. Uh -huh. And sometimes pharmacy is... Um, I don't want to use the word forgotten, but people don't realize that we're there. Right. And so the things that we do are very different. So essentially, hopefully none of you guys have had to be in a hospital, but if you've had family members or friends, and I hope them either, but basically at a hospital, every medication that they receive, whether it be something that they take by mouth, orally, any type of injection, or the IV, the things that you see hanging on the pole, and things of that nature. We, the pharmacy, that's the reason why we have so many staff. We take care of every single medication that you would receive. Mm -hmm. um, and so some of the things that we do in the pharmacy is we prepare all those medications. And it's a little bit different than in the community pharmacy because for all the tablets and capsules and things of that nature, we can't just give the bottle to the nurse and say, you know, this is for this patient, give them to her. That's not the way it works. Right. We have to do what's called unidosing. We put them into single dose packets mm -hmm. so that the nurse only takes out what they need for that patient at the time. Right. Um, so we have something called an automated dispensing machine. Um, and I know this is probably going over some people's heads, but essentially that we stock with over um, these machines are kind of like little robots that we have on every unit mm -hmm. and we have over a hundred of them. They're like a little mini pharmacy and the nurses go and get their meds there. So we're responsible for stocking those. So imagine we have over a hundred of these little robot machines that pharmacy has to take care of staffing uh, to stocking to ensure right. that we put the right meds, the right amount, things of that nature, mm -hmm. um, that they're safe, um, that the packaging that we're putting them in isn't going to degrade it. I mean, it, there's so much that goes into it. Right. Now that's just the oral part, the yeah. oral meds. <laughs> Uh, excuse me i'm sorry i have a little bit of cold <clears throat> then you go into the iv and the injection part now some injections come in a little vial those can be stocked in that robot but then we have some of those things that we have to make and we have to do what's called sterile compounding mm -hmm. and so for some of you guys who I, they're they're all high school students right i believe there there could be both but mostly high school okay perfect so we have our pharmacy technicians who are, you know, we've got pharmacists and pharmacy technicians who work in a, in a pharmacy, like I mentioned earlier, and, you know, we, we need each other to make this work. Right. Uh, we're at the same level. It's not like one's above the other, uh, but we have what, what the pharmacy technicians at one of their roles or jobs is that they're the ones compounding all the uh, sterile compounded injections or sterile compounded uh, IV fluids, IV meds, and pharmacists are usually the ones who check off. Pharmacists can make them too if they're needed, right. but because of just how busy our environment is, that's why we have pharmacy techs and why we have pharmacists. So um, essentially, uh, these medications get made, compounded, and then they get checked off. So all those bags that you've ever seen hanging or even in a movie or mm -hmm. things like that, right. Uh, those things are made by pharmacy. You'll have, there's some that turn yellow, there's some that are red, there's some that are um, a very dark color. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're involved with all that. Now, again, this is just the, now that part of it, what I was talking about is just a dispensing part of pharmacy, dispensing medications to our patient. Then on top of that, we have clinical services. So clinical services are the pharmacists that are a little bit more specialized maybe, and they're there rounding with the team, rounding with mm -hmm. the doctor, with the nurse, respiratory therapy, dietary, uh, things of that nature, trying to ensure that we're giving optimal and the best care to our patients. 
Good. So um, that's what our clinical pharmacists do. And we have quite a bit. We have, I believe, uh, 18 of us clinical pharmacists that are rounding on almost every unit of the hospital um, that we take care of that. And then, of course, on top of that, we have our administrators who are the ones that oversee um, everything. But um, that's a little bit about hospital pharmacy. So if you think about it, like I mentioned earlier, and I, I know I think some people were, um, may not have heard it, but we've got over 100 staff members at DHR, and that's why we've got so many layers and so many things that we do. There's no way we could do it with any less than that. <laughs> right, right. Well, I want to talk a little bit more about being on the team because, you know, as, as educators, we tell kids all the time, um, you know, once you get out and start working, you're going to have to be on a team. You're going to have to work with others. Um, and I don't think most people think of pharmacists as being on a team because like you said, their experience is retail and they see them back there kind of by themselves or with other pharmacists. But uh, talk a little bit about uh, the team approach to patient care and pharmac how pharmacy is included in that. Um, the team approach and patient care, um, is huge. It's tremendous. Um, I don't think there's any other way to do it. If you don't have that team mentality throughout or as much as possible throughout the people or throughout your staff, it would be very, very hard to do the job that we do. Um, and I would say that's in any in any pharmacy, I would hope that even those community pharmacies, even though you may not see it because there's very few, maybe two or three, you know, they have to work together as a team to ensure that they're doing everything correctly, they're doing everything safely, and they're doing everything efficiently. Um, one cannot perform their job without the other, uh, you know. Um, so I think that that teamwork approach is just essential. It's It's the teamwork, it's ensuring that you're no, you know, uh, you're only as good as your weakest link for lack of a, a, right. a better phrase I can think of. We, we all have to try to work together and help each other out. And I think the most important thing about all this, and especially in hospital pharmacy, and this is across all um, healthcare professional, uh, healthcare professions at really any, really any profession. Really? Um, it's oh, yeah, communication. You're right. Uh, communication and transparency, which is what teamwork kind of is. You can't have a team if you don't communicate with one another and if you're not transparent with one another. Right. But you must have those in order to ensure that, you know, we're doing we're doing the best we can. I mean, we're for pharmacists and healthcare professionals, we're literally taking care of patients' lives. So we there is no there is no time to be, oh, Karina is mad at, you know, yeah. somebody else or you we can't do we don't have time for that. Right. We don't have time for that. It will uh, essentially become and possibly could affect the patient. And we can't do that. We can't do that. I agree. Yeah. So, I, I mean, agree. it's huge. Yeah. I, I come from a, I was an athlete back in, in high school. Um, mm -hmm. Huge. I coach my kids teams. I think teamwork is just so essential for life skills, for work skills um, and being able to communicate and be transparent and have fun, have fun doing it. If you love what you do, It'll work out. <laughs> yes, I agree. I agree with you. Um, another question that I have has to do with uh, specialty um, areas. I'll, I'll tell you why I asked, because a lot, of, um, a lot of things I think about, I think about from experiences I have. And I have a friend who had a thyroid condition, mm -hmm. and she had to have a special pill that she took that was delivered by a special pharmacist that had to do with radiation. Oh. And when she yeah. took it, she had to be separated from her family. And then for so many days, she couldn't be around them. She couldn't be around anybody. So can you, that's the only area I know of, which is I think called nuclear pharmacy. Yeah. Yeah. But what other specialty areas are there in pharmacy? Uh, you brought up a good one because I <clears throat> hadn't mentioned that one here yet, but that's uh, nuclear um, you've got, uh, of course, like I mentioned already, we have a transplant pharmacy who works mm -hmm. with our, uh, kidney transplant patients. We have, uh, I mentioned our endocrinology, you know, those are specific for, 
uh, diabetes and hormonal uh, treatment. It's really endocrinology altogether. Right. Um, of course, you can then go into, you know, you can then go into the field of more like drug discovery and research where they may be doing literal drug discovery stuff. Uh, they could even work for drug companies where they're out promoting uh, the medication, like drug reps is what they call. There's some pharmacists who do that and they go and they give talks. Uh -huh. um, and then, of course, you have your professors, those people who ultimately just teach. Uh -huh. uh, that, that's what they do. Uh, they may have a little bit of clinical work. Um, we do have our psychiatric pharmacies who work uh, at behavioral, at our behavioral unit, and they're sp specific for that. Um, I'm trying to think of another one that's like nuclear, that is like way out on left field. That one is very, very unique. They actually work from hours of um, like two in the morning to like um, uh, noon uh -huh. because they're working with radioactive uh, right. medications and they're used... So essentially you take it so that when they go in and do like a CT scan or an MR, uh, MRI or some kind of uh, imaging, it'll light up whatever they want it to be lit right. up. And that's, mm -hmm. that's what it is. So those radioactive materials don't last for very long. So you have to make it right before. And then that way it's there in the morning for the test. Uh, so it's really neat. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Uh, oh, and then you've got, uh, I forgot. Okay. Then you have those that can work in the state board of pharmacy where oh. all they do is actually compliance. So they're ensuring that pharmacists uh, and pharmacies, not just pharmacists, pharmacies or anybody who dispenses medication meets all the, uh, you know, is following all our laws and regulations. And there's actually pharmacy techs who ha can do that also. Mm -hmm. um, what am I missing? Uh, teaching, research, clinical, of course, community, you know, right. HEB, Walgreens. Um, and remember that those that you're seeing are just your, you know, your staff or what we call the pharmacist in charge for that pharmacy. Then you've got the pharmacist on top of them that may be regional. And mm -hmm. then even on top of them who are at the corporate level. So, you know, there's pharmacists all the way up that ladder. Right. Uh, so that's something that you can be involved in. Um, and of course, any type of administrative work, like I mentioned, pharmacists can go get their MBAs and things of that nature. And then they can be in what we call the C-suite, you know, uh, uh, the chief of operations or things of that nature, uh, that, that, you know, that nature. Um, I just got reminded of one, um, informatics. So that's kind of a new and upcoming one where we have pharmacists who are uh, basic, really working behind the scenes to ensure that like especially in the hospital, everything that the doctor sees or how they order their meds and the way that we pharmacy verify the meds, how they're coming across and communicating with everything mm -hmm. with the computer in the background uh, without getting too technical. Right. Uh, we need pharmacists to do that because they have to be aware of uh, the medications a little bit and what security measures or safety measures we need to have in place for certain things. So that's a that's a pharmacy informatics uh, type of pharmacist. Right. That Oh, that's very interesting. I always think all of that is very interesting. Yeah. Uh, I want to remind our classes that are watching, if you have any questions, I shouldn't make sure that I have the chat open, which I do, because um, sometimes I block it and I didn't block it. <laughs> it's open. So if you have any questions, go ahead and put it in the chat and we'll relay those to Dr. Garza. But the, oh, before we finish, uh, yeah. veterinary, we can't forget about that one. Oh, veterinary that's right. pharmacy. Yes. Yeah. You can be yeah. a pharmacist and take care of the medications for all the animals. Yes, I always think it's interesting um, when animals can not not all drugs. So don't go giving yeah. your your <laughs> your pets drugs. But sometimes animals can take things that are formulated for humans, which I always think that's very interesting, and it and it helps them. We had a we had an older cat, and I don't remember exactly what we gave her, but she was able to take something that we had on hand, which I think was really great. So I also want to talk about drugs themselves, because I think it's very interesting and, and I don't know all the details. So that's why I'm asking you um, that they're, I guess they're tiered. Certain medicines are tiered. Like you have things that you have uh, medicines that you can just get off the shelf. Uh -oh. And then there's medicines that you can get from behind the counter that you don't right. need a prescription for. 
But then you have things that you have to have a prescription for. And also there's medicines that you have to show ID to get that medicine. So can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, so essentially those are all rules and regulations set uh, by either the FDA or uh, by our state board of pharmacy. Mm -hmm. So what happens is you're exactly correct. We have our meds that are what are called OTC over the counter. Right. Those are all the meds that you see outside of the pharmacy um, in your HEB, CVS, Walgreens, really anywhere. I mean, you can even get stuff at the gas station, <laughs> really. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So those are things that you would be able to get there. Then you've got uh, medications that are still considered over the counter, but, um, or I guess I shouldn't say that medications that don't require a prescription, but you can still get them that have regulations. Oh, okay. and so what you're talking about with an ID um, would be Sudafed. Okay. And so the reason why anything that has Sudafedrin in it is behind the counter, you don't need a prescription, but because it has components that can be used incorrectly or maliciously, right? Um, the state board and pharmacies have to ensure that the people who are purchasing don't purchase more than a certain amount right. every month. Mm -hmm. And so that is why you show ID and it literally is registered into a system. And a funny story, actually, uh, my mom went to buy some, she had a cold like last week, well, they gave her the wrong one, oh. so she returned it, but her name was officially registered, so she couldn't go buy another one. Oh, no. <laughs> and I try, you know, being in healthcare, I try to think like, well, that's not right. They made the mistake. They gave yeah. you the wrong one, but there was just no way yeah. uh, to, to, fix, to fix that, unfortunately. Now, I think eventually there should be a way to fix that, but, right. you know, but that is how strict uh, the system is. It literally will not let you purchase. Well, so I, those are over the counter, then you've uh -huh. got medications without a prescription that you can get behind the counter. Yes. Then you have your prescriptive medications, which you can only get with a prescription. Then in that category, we have what's called our controlled substances. And so our controlled substances are those drugs that uh, really you can uh, become, you have addictive properties. Right. And so those are those meds that are controlled where we keep certain counts, things of that nature. And there is, there's controls, actually schedules one through five, but one are mostly all illegal. We don't use those. <laughs> um, yes. Two is the ones that we use. So those schedule two drugs actually require a specific type of prescription, either on paper or electronically. Mm -hmm. um, and they're very specific and those have regulations and all that stuff is kept. Um, and those are, are really, I think the only different kinds. Now, ones that you kind of have to think about are immunizations because those are meds, right? Right. Um, now those, there is some that you can go to the pharmacy and get, right? And that some pharmacies can give out. Doesn't necessarily require a prescription, but some of them do mm -hmm. uh, where the doctor has to say, it's okay to give you this or that. And some of those rules have become more lax post COVID, right. uh, but there's still some in place. Uh, but really you'll see the list of all the, the immunizations pharmacies can give, uh, but yeah. So uh, tell us a little bit about like the day-to-day -day life. So <laughs> what's a typical day for you at the hospital? <laughs> um, most pharmacists, maybe not you in particular. Yeah, I was pharmacists. like, for me, for me, it's a little bit different in my role, which is why I never would have thought I would be in academia. And, um, but man, I really have the best of all worlds because mm -hmm. I get to precept um, and mentor our students and our residents and even students like this. I still have my clinical work because I get to work in the ER uh, whenever they need my help or I try to work in the mornings when I can. Um, and then I also do my administrative part that I learned a little bit uh, when I was at Mission Regional that we also get to do mm -hmm. uh, with our team at DHR. So I really get to do, oh, and now I get to do a little bit of research and even teaching. I haven't yet, but I'm hoping to get into that realm soon. So I really get a little bit of everything. So I really love it. Right. But I would say a day-to-day -day life of a hospital pharmacist. So you're going to have kind of two. You're going to have your clinical staff pharmacist and your clinical pharmacist. Mm -hmm. So your clinical staff are the ones that are going to be back there verifying the medications, checking all the meds, making sure that everything that we're dispensing out of the pharmacy is accurate, that it's safe, that it's intact, 
um, that is what is needed out there. So they're there uh, verifying all the orders for physicians, checking the medications, uh, mixing uh, chemotherapy, doing calculations on uh, what's called total parental nutrition, which is uh, basically feeding through the IV, right? So we have to calculate calories and electrolytes and things of that nature. Uh, not to mention with chemotherapy, we have to ensure that dosing is correct because those are very, very obviously dangerous meds um, and require double checks. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what the pharmacist is, the clinical staff pharmacist is doing. They're also doing some clinical work because if there's some medications that need to be adjusted, in some way, maybe for somebody's liver function or their kidney function, or maybe they can't take anything by mouth. It has to be, or they can only use liquids. Right. So that's the clinical part of what those pharmacists are doing. They may still have to call and fix some of those things to ensure we're giving optimal care to our patients. Then we have our clinical pharmacist. And so they're rounding with the team like I mentioned before, physician, nurse, right. dietary, respiratory, basically the whole healthcare team. And we're ensuring that before those orders that got sent to the pharmacy, we ensure that they're optimal care for that patient. So, right. you know, those clinical pharmacists, we have some in the ICU. So they're taking care of our critical patients or our cardiac ICU. Then we have some in our surgical and medical ICU that take care of our very sick surgical and just general medical patients. Then we have a neuro ICU. They take care of our neuro, our, our, you know, anything with the brain that might be critical patients. So they're there. So they're going to be specific care for that. Then we have clinical pharmacists that take care of our general population. Uh, maybe just, you know, where they're not very, very sick in the ICU, but they're downgraded to a regular floor. And we basically have a pharmacist almost to every you, every floor, every unit. Mm -hmm. And so same thing, they round with the hospital team and the hospitalist and ensure that all the meds are correct, that they're, they're correctly dosed for the patient's renal and kidney function, uh, renal kidney and liver function, as well as can we maybe, maybe they're taking too many meds. Maybe there's a way for us to say, you know what, I don't think they need this anymore. Uh, maybe the antibiotic, they start off with a really strong one because they don't know exactly what bacteria we were hitting mm -hmm. or trying to target. Now we know. So let's go ahead and what we call de-escalate that antibiotic to be more specific so that we don't use what we like to call our big guns. Right. We want to save those for uh, those antibiotics oh. for our patients who are really ill. Yes. Yes. I yeah. can see that. You just brought up a really good point and, and it's something else. Um, I know from experience that someone um, can have their their uh, DNA um, explored. I don't know what the right word is. Uh -huh. And then there are certain medicines I can tell you in relationship to chemotherapy. There are certain medicines that work better for what they discover when they do the DNA um, research. So can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, I think that's still, I don't know too much about it, but that's an up and coming, um, drug discovery where they're trying to get a little bit more specific, basically per the genetics of, of the person, right. uh, and not only the genetics of the person themselves getting to that, basically that's how the COVID vaccine came about. They got into the, you know, exactly how that virus all the way down to the, to the genetic makeup of, of mm -hmm. that virus. Um, and so essentially um, there are specific medications for these patients. So there are certain patients that have certain conditions mm -hmm. and it comes from their genetics or their genes. And they, they, I can't think of the name of them, but I mean, I don't know too many or too much about it, Yeah. but that is that up and coming, um, what we're trying to do with drug discovery and figuring out, you know, how can we better care for our patients more specifically so that, you know, specifically with chemotherapy, Yes. Um, you know, it's very toxic to the body. Mm -hmm. So if we can figure out a way for it to be more targeted and hit those cancer cells only, we can try to do that. But of course it may be different for everybody. Right. So how do we do that? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that is a whole nother, I mean, it's pretty neat. It's way over my head. Uh, <laughs> well, but, I, think it's uh, 
I think it's very interesting that, well, and, and we can talk a little bit about that also, how I, I know people think it was a long time, but how fast they came up with the COVID vaccine. I, I, I mean, I know from uh, experience that that was uh, unbelievable. I know that most drugs are decades coming onto yeah. the market and that was ready. And I know that was a, a problem for some people, but I mean, really it was amazing how fast uh, that came to the market. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I think considering um, the issue, yes. uh, you know, what was going on with the pandemic and stuff like that, I think it actually went to show that it is possible. And really after that, they have removed a lot of what they'll call, and they talked about it, the red right. tape, all right. the steps that have to be put into place. Um, but they did everything um basically what they would do with any other med you know it went through all the different trial phases nothing was skipped uh you know they they did it you know the only thing is of course uh long-term effects but really even with medicines that take you know five six seven years you're you're still not going to get that you're That's only going right. to get so much if it's proven to help and decrease the spread and decrease the um, uh, essentially, um, the virality, how, how, how sick people get when they get it. Um, and it worked in several of those trials. And I, I, I knew pharmacists who took part in some of those vaccine trials and they're still part of it. It's, it's ongoing. Yeah. Um, you know, and of course all of us who have gotten it now are all <laughs> essentially part of that study. Yes. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, it was just, it goes to show that working together and several mind, you know, you know, great minds got together and figured out. And now the, the beauty of the COVID vaccine is that the, the mRNA or the way that they developed that vaccine had already been discovered. Right. So the other vaccine, the Ebola one, I think was the main one that mm -hmm. they had already used a similar mechanism uh, to deliver, you know, um, basically the mRNA to help us fight the virus if we were ever to contract it. And I mean, for me personally, I knew the vaccine were or it was working because the moment it came out, our numbers, you know, dropped. Right. Uh, people were getting as sick. Um, so, you know, how do we how do we explain that if we didn't have the vaccine? So, yes. you know, I know there's a lot of and it can become controversial. It does. I, know. I don't want to get into that, but, you know with any drug discovery, those are the steps that we have to take. And with this pandemic, we needed to figure out a solution fast. I do think they went through with the appropriate safety measures. Right. Um, there will always be things um, that come up. And now that everybody's a little bit more alert, it's kind of like when cancer came about. Um, the more we learned about it, the more you heard of people getting it because people were aware of it. Yes. And so that tends to happen with any new drug or any new virus or any new disease that comes about, um, that's part of it. But we want to know what it is. That way we know how to treat it or try to find out how to treat it. Exactly. So speaking of new drugs and all that, what, what do you see as the future of pharmacy? What do you think um, is coming uh, on for our high school students? Because I always <clears> say this, being a STEM uh, person, I always say we don't know what our kindergartners are going to do once they enter the work. Like what they're going to do doesn't exist right now. Yeah. So what are some of the things that you see in the future of pharmacy? Um, well, I'll have to say anything in that STEM, specifically even health healthcare. Um, always remember, you're always going to have a job. <laughs> Yes. There's always going to be people you need to take care of in healthcare. That's yes. never going to go away. Um, for the future of pharmacy, uh, man, so many doors open, even though COVID was a very unfortunate time. Um, you know, we were basically the front runners ensuring that that vaccine was getting out to as many people as possible uh, when it came out. Uh, we were administering it. We were preparing it. Uh, we were trying to educate people about it. Um, a lot of that was being done by pharmacy. And so I really think it opened the door uh, for us to really practice at the top of our license. So 
essentially getting in, and this may be a lot for some, uh, it may be hard to understand, but right now, essentially as a pharmacist, we only dispense meds that were written by a physician, right? right? In some cases, <clears throat> if you can have a collaborative practice is what it's called with a physician, the physician allows you to write under their authority. Mm -hmm. Where I think the future is going is that, you know, uh, with pharmacists specifically, and in some cases they may already do this depending on their states and what laws are allowed or um, in the government, uh, some places it allows it, where if somebody comes with a positive COVID test or somebody comes with a positive flu test or strep or something of that nature that they don't necessarily have to go to the doctor. If we know what meds are needed to treat that, we can treat that without right. them going. So I think that that is where pharmacy is going. Now there will be a cap to that. Um, you know, we don't want to, we're not going to take over what physicians do. And by all means, we are not physicians, right. but I think there is clear cut disease states <clears throat> that we know exactly how to treat mm -hmm. that we could treat that even physicians would do the exact same thing we would, because there's a protocol there's, right. you know, already guidelines in place for what you would do. So we're going to move into that realm a little bit. We're already doing that with immunizations. If you think about it, we're already giving those immunizations, you know, pa patients can come to the pharmacy and get one. Some of them don't need a prescription. Some of them do. Um, now, besides that, um, I really think that there's going to be a lot that comes about with newer medications and being more specific to treat, um, how would I say it? you know, if God forbid this were to happen, if you and I both had a uh, pneumonia or uh hypertension, let's put right. hypertension in there, hypertension, my hypertension might be different than yours. Mm -hmm. So being able to ensure that we have optimal independent care for each patient, right? So your care might be a little bit different than mine, um, but guidelines are so broad. So it needs to be a little bit more patient specific. And right. I think that's where we're going. And that's, you know, um, get on my soapbox here, but that's why it's so important for me to come back to the Valley, mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of studies don't get studied on the Hispanic population. I agree. And we are, uh, historically known to have more diabetes, hypertension, uh, hyperlipidemia, which is your cholesterol, uh, kidney issues, liver issues, um, it's all based on our diet. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but we weren't, we are not studied that often. And really mm -hmm. there's a lot of that coming here, uh, to the Valley right now. We have a huge liver Institute that they're doing that, mm -hmm. um, to see, you know, how better it may be different to treat us than, you know, somebody else, uh, who may not be Hispanic, um, right. It, it it's and it's nothing against it's nothing against any race or anything it's just it's that that's that that's like that's what it is that we are historically known to have higher numbers of these disease states and suffer from these disease states so it may be different for people to treat hypertension in me than maybe somebody who isn't hispanic so having and, more individualized care yes. Which, exactly. And, well, you know, I, I think it's very interesting. <clears throat> I think you're absolutely right. And it really doesn't have anything to do with any group or person, but I have a grandson who has red hair and I've been reading so much about how different red, like they, they feel pain more intensely. There's a lot of things about just something as simple as that as having red hair. I mean, we all know that, you know, like they burn easily and all of that, but there's really a lot more to it. And, and I think that that's very interesting. Yeah, I mean, more, I think, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, having more individualized care, uh, especially for let's say Hispanics who have traditionally been underserved, um, mm -hmm. more research into what will work better is can only make the community better. A hundred percent. And I think that is where pharmacists will play a role yes. because we are what we consider the, or we would like to think that we're the drug expert. So we might be able to say in this class of medications, this might work better for you than what you were on previously or things of that nature. Cause it may be that we don't have to discover any new drugs. 
It's just picking the ones we already have that might work better for you. Right. And so that's where research comes, research comes into play. And so I really think that that's kind of the next step forward. Right. Um, you know, and, and we heard a lot of that with COVID. It was, it was affecting, you know, specific races a little bit more than others. And mm-hmm. that's not, again, nothing against anything else. That is, that is statistics. That is what it is. So how right. can we ensure that we provide better care? And the only way we can do that is by doing research and trying to figure out why. Yes, I um, agree. I yeah. agree. And, and I have to say, I know DHR has an Institute for Research and Development. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's very important that there is it a is. focus on the Hispanic community and what they need as far as health care to improve life in general for the entire valley. I oh, 100%. 100%. Yeah. So tell me some of the challenges there are to being a pharmacist. Oh, that's hard for me because I love being a pharmacist. I'm so I, I can passionate imagine. about it. And you, and you exude that. So. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I mean, some of the challenges are just, um, for me specifically in the ER, you know, we'll see some pretty tough stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we can't help it there. Um, um, I wouldn't necessarily call it a challenge, but it could be for some, <clears throat> is that we have to continue learning. Yes. So um, we do have to get specifically continuing education for our license, but really (laughs) you have to continue doing that or else you're not going to be treating patients correctly. So it is, I don't want to call it a challenge because I think it's really neat that in my profession, we have to continue learning. Mm -hmm. We cannot stop or we'll be behind. And so I think that that is really neat with our profession, but it can be challenging because, you know, that's a lot of stuff you got to do outside of work. Right. Uh, we still have to take care of our patients, but and I got to read guidelines and I got to keep up with what's going on. You know, oh, they just put, you know, this restriction on this vaccine or the, on this med or something like that, that I might not have been aware of. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so I have to find it. <clears throat> um, so that can be challenging. Um, maybe not challenging for me, but for some people, pharmacists and the community have to be on their feet a lot. Right. Um, that can be tough for some. Um, you know, uh, um, in the community, sometimes people can be a little, uh, not so nice. Yes. <laughs> I would say community <laughs> pharmacists might deal with that a little bit. Um, but I think at the end of the day, as pharmacists, I would hope that they know we're in it for the right reasons. And those patients are probably hurting or suffering or right. not feeling well. Um, so we want to do everything we can to help them. Um, and like I said, it's hard for me to find challenges. Um, <laughs> okay, then I'll ask you a better question. What's the best part about being a pharmacist? <laughs> oh, helping our patients and working yeah. with my team. Yeah. Um, yeah, but there's nothing team. better to see somebody who was really ill. Um, and it's a personal story. My grandma had a stroke it almost be one year ago, and she went to DHR. Um, and that's where I really got to see just how important all the things that we do and everybody that was involved from the ER physician to the neurologist, to the ER doctor, to the lab technicians, to the pharmacist that had to mix her med. Um, She was 85 years old. They told me she had a 50% chance to live and she's lived with us right now. So um, that is the best. We, I saw everything work in action and it's not just my grandma. There's several of those stories, specifically with stroke patients nowadays that you hear mm-hmm. uh, that we have helped. And um, it's really seen that. I think it's pretty amazing that we can just help people. Um, and then I'm very blessed to have such an amazing team at DHR and even at U of H. I mean, uh, couldn't ask for anything better. We talk about you know teamwork earlier and we really do have that team-based approach at DHR or we do our best to do that um and and that's why you have stories like that of my grandma we wouldn't be able to do it with anything less so that's really great yeah yeah. so I want to remind our participants that if you have a question we're getting ready to wrap up the session go ahead and put it in the chat and I'll ask Dr. Garza but Dr. Garza for our high school students who are listening what advice do you have for them if they're thinking about going into uh, pharmacology? Um, 
the advice I could say is just uh, take your study seriously. Um, grades matter. Um, you know, um, it, it's just really important to be aware of that. Get involved. Um, go out to community service. If you really want to do pharmacy, you know, call up, call up DHR, call up your HEB, your Walgreens, or your your Leeds pharmacy, or signs, your community pharmacies. Um, get in there, watch. For the most part, you know, now post COVID, we love to get people who want to help, specifically in pharmacy. I'd like to think that if they don't let you, just give me a call and probably call somebody. It's a small world in pharmacy, so. Yeah. Um, you know, in a hospital, sometimes it is a little bit more difficult. You got to go through background checks, things of that nature, but, um, you know, to get out there, but really it's just focusing on your studies. If you know what you want to do, you know, hit it hard and start doing it. Uh, start trying to get out there, learn everything you can about that profession. Um, you know, do well in high school and then continue to try to do well in college, um, and at the university level. Um, you know, because grades do matter before you get an interview to any type of graduate program, they're going to vet you yeah. and they're going to look at those things. They're going to look at your grades. They're going to look at your community service. They're going to look at the things that you've done. Mm -hmm. So they may never even get to talk to you, even though you may be an amazing applicant and you may, you may be that diamond in the rough, Right. but you, you got to do those things. It's, it's unfortunate that that's part of that process, but, but it is, that's yeah. the process. And to be honest, the reason we do that is because, and, and in pharmacy, you know, it is not an easy um, school to go to. Pharmacy school is not easy. Um, you have to study hard. There's a lot of work, um, a lot of tests, <laughs> yeah. um, and a lot that you have to learn in a very short amount of time. So the reason why we look at grades is because we want to make sure that whoever we're putting there can go get through that program. Right. And so it's not yeah. just because we want to weed you out. We don't want to put you somewhere where you may not succeed. Exactly. So, exactly. you know, it's all those things. And I'll tell you, especially here in the Valley, do things like this, get with mentoring programs, practice your interview skills, go out and just talk to people. That's where it helps to shadow that communication. And if you get to that interview and how you interview, oh my gosh, can go so far. Um, you know, you could be that one that you, that they say, you know what, maybe this grades wasn't the best, but I really want to interview this person. And then you interview and you blow it out of the water. You will get your seat. I promise. That's great. That's great. Well, Dr. Garza, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate it. I appreciate everything you and your team have done for the PATHS program this year. Um, I have to say the work-based learning was phenomenal. Um, it's always great to have you or anyone from your team talk to us um, because we enjoy it and we know that you're working hard to make uh, healthcare in the Valley better. So thank you so much. Oh, no, thank you. And I have to credit my team because I know so without Selena, Bridget and Ron and without you guys, it would not be where we are. So well, they're, they're amazing people. And you're right. When you talk about your team, I know exactly what you're talking about. You have an amazing team. And I think that makes all the difference in the world. And thank you guys for being here today. Uh, we'll be back in April with the new cyber mentoring. So have a good Friday and a better weekend. Bye. Bye, everybody.